Although the Joint Center for Structural Genomics has provided your clones for you, we wanted to make sure that you knew how they were generated. So this mini lecture will cover the cloning of a gene into an expression vector. This slide shows a flowchart generated by the company Kyogen that outlines how you would go from gene to protein using E. coli recombinant protein overexpression. The first two steps in the red box are the steps that I mentioned have been done by the Joint Center for Structural Genomics for you. They have given us the vector with your gene of interest cloned into the vector. The last step, transformation, you will do in the lab. Cloning is generating identical copies of nucleic acid sequences, organisms, or cells. Those new copies need to be able to give rise to a new generation in order to be called cloning. In this lab, we clone DNA sequences and we amplify them by growth in bacteria. So our DNA sequences are considered clones. Here's a general flowchart of how cloning works. First you select the gene that you would like to clone and you typically PCR amplify that from genomic DNA. The PCR fragments are then cleaved with the same restriction enzymes that the cloning or expression vector is cut with. The gene fragments and the cut vector are mixed and ligated together. The ligated vector that now has the gene of interest is transformed into E. coli. During the transformation, not all E. coli pick up the plasmid. Thus, the plasmid has been encoded with an antibiotic resistance gene. In this plasmid, PET28, the antibiotic resistance gene encodes for a protein that can degrade canamycin. It is highlighted with a red star in the vector map. This allows all the bacteria that do not contain the plasmid to be killed with the antibiotic. Thus, the surviving E. coli all contain the plasmid that has the gene of interest in it. This process is called selection. Common antibiotics used are ampicillin, chloramphenicol, erythromycin, canamycin, streptomycin, rifampicin, tetracycline, and many others. What's important to note is that each plasmid has one or two genes that encodes a specific resistance. So when using a particular plasmid, you need to know which antibiotic you should use for selection. Let's recap this process. We have a DNA fragment that encodes the gene of interest. We have our plasmid expression vector. Each of these fragments is digested with restriction enzymes and ligated together to form a recombinant plasmid. The recombinant plasmid is then mixed with E. coli that have been pretreated with calcium chloride, which makes them more susceptible to picking up exogenous DNA. The cells that do not take up the plasmid die on the antibiotic selection plate, where the ones that have actually transformed with the plasmid that has the gene of interest in it grow and divide so that the clone is propagated. You should know some specifics about the players in this process. Your expression vector has your gene of interest cloned into it by the Joint Center for Structural Genomics. You'll be using E. coli cells that are specific to this vector in terms of propagation and expression. And your inserted sequence is the gene of your protein of interest. This inserted sequence is in the vector that is provided to you. An expression vector is a double-stranded circular piece of DNA that can replicate in a host. Four requirements of an expression vector are multiple cloning sites. These are a variety of restriction sites in one area that allow you to clone or ligate your gene of interest into the vector. An origin of replication is required in order for the plasmid to replicate within the host cell. A gene specifying antibiotic resistance, which we've talked about in terms of selection, and a promoter controlling the expression of the gene inserted into the vector. Cloning vectors do not require the gene of interest to be under an inducible promoter, but expression vectors do. This slide shows a schematic or vector map of the vector PET28, which is a commonly used vector in molecular biology and protein expression. It is not the vector that you're using in lab, but is a good example to show you the different components of a vector, specifically an expression vector. On the map of, at the top left, you should be able to identify three of the four required elements of an expression vector. You should be able to identify the gene that encodes canamycin resistance, the origin of replication, and the multiple cloning sites. The fourth required element, the promoter site, is not obvious in the vector map, but in the sequence of the multiple cloning sites region, shown at the bottom, here you should be able to identify 
the T7 promoter. This promoter responds to IPTG, which stands for isopropyl beta D1 thiogalactopyranoside. That is a chemical inducer that when added to the E. coli will turn on the transcription of the gene of interest. You can also see all of the different multiple cloning sites, that is the different restriction sites in which you can insert your gene of interest. You can also identify where you could stitch a his tag to your gene, either at the N terminus or the C terminus. Here's what I mean. If you inserted your gene at NDA1 so that the start codon of your gene started at NDA1, you would have an encoded tag that would be transcribed and translated with your protein. This tag has a methionine, glycine, serine, serine, six histidines, serine, serine, glycine, leucine, valine, proline, arginine, glycine, serine, and then the start codon of your gene. The his tag is also followed by a thrombin protease cleavage site, which would allow you to later remove the tag after your protein has been expressed. There are different types of expression vectors. First, remember the difference between an expression vector and a cloning vector. Cloning vectors lack the inducible expression element. There are many types of expression vectors. They differ in their promoters and many different plasmid properties. Those that have different promoters have different chemical inducers. For example, we talked about IPTG, but in lab you'll be using arabinose. Be sure that you know the difference and why you're using arabinose. Each plasmid has a matching E. coli host. There are many hosts for different plasmids, but you need to make sure that the different properties of your plasmid and your host are compatible. There are also different plasmids based on the different constructs such as the his tag that we discussed earlier. There are GST fusions and many other types of fusions that can be used if desired. I want to explain how a chemical can induce expression, which also is correlated to the host in which you would use for an expression vector. Here we show the schematic for an IPTG induction. The host cell requires a LAC1 gene that encodes the LAC repressor and an DE3 element that has the T7 RNA polymerase gene under the LAC promoter. T7 RNA polymerase gene is an exogenous piece of DNA that has been incorporated into the E. coli genome. T7 is a bacteriophage, so they've taken the, the DNA that encodes a phage RNA polymerase and introduced it into the E. coli genome under an IPTG-inducible LAC promoter. Upon IPTG induction, the LAC repressor recruits the polymerase to transcribe the T7 RNA polymerase gene. The T7 RNA polymerase is what binds to the T7 promoter, which then is on your PET vector in controlling the transcription of your target gene. Thus, your E. coli host needs to have this exogenous T7 RNA polymerase introduced into its genomic genome under the LAC promoter for which upon IPTG binding LAC repressor will recruit the E. coli RNA polymerase to transcribe the T7 RNA polymerase which then induces transcription of your target gene on your PET vector. Which host and plasmid combination do you use? Making that decision depends on what you want. Do you want an affinity tag? Some vectors have them, some don't. Do you want the protein to be expressed to the cytoplasmic part of the cell, the periplasm, or even secreted? Certain vectors have particular leader sequences encoded in them that would allow you to control the localization of expression of your protein. Does your protein have disulfides? There are certain cell strains that can accommodate disulfides better than others. Is your protein toxic to E. coli? Some expression vectors are a little more leaky. That is, that even without adding IPTG, you may have some basal level of expression. If your protein's toxic, you don't really want that to occur, and so you might use a different vector that has a tighter promoter element. There are many different requirements that go into the decision in selecting a vector host system. On the next set of slides are descriptions of E. coli strains on page 72, you have a description of the cell strain you will use. There are several genotypes that are given to describe this E. coli strain, and the slides subsequent to this one explain what some of those notations mean.